Hey there students, today we're going to talk about the Counter-Reformation. Going to start you off with a little bit of Isaac Newton. You'll be learning about him soon when you study the scientific revolution. Uh, Isaac Newton once said that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Now Isaac Newton's talking about physics, but keep in mind sometimes the principles of physics can be applied to human relationships. So when you look at what's happened with Luther, with Calvin, with Henry VIII, these forces of the Reformation, a response from the Catholic Church is necessary, uh, or else the Catholic Church is on its way to extinction. And the Catholic response to the Reformation is often referred to as the Counter-Reformation. And there are three components to the Counter-Reformation. First of all, there is the Council of Trent. Second of all, the Society of Jesus, and third, the revival of spirituality. So let's first look at the Council of Trent. Uh, the Council of Trent met in three different sessions between 1545 and 1563. And there are two components to the Council of Trent. There is first the affirmation of Catholic doctrine, and then there is the reformation of church practice. So two things, affirmation and reformation. Keep that in mind, especially what is being affirmed and what is being reformed. So first, let's take a look at the affirmation of Catholic doctrine. So when you look at uh, Catholic sources of authority, you have three. First of all, you have the scriptures, the foundation of Catholic doctrine. Second, tradition. This is a respect for precedent. What has the church done before? And third, you have the magisterium. This comes from the Latin word magister for teacher. This is the teaching authority of the pope and the bishops of the church. So three sources of authority, those being scripture, church tradition, and the magisterium, the teaching authority of the pope and bishops. Now, this is a repudiation of the principle of sola scriptura, which was uh, championed by Martin Luther. Martin Luther rejects church tradition in favor of scripture, and he doesn't believe that the church has teaching authority. He believes in the priesthood of all believers. So this is a rejection of that. It's a rejection of pretty much anything about the Reformation. Can you say that word, Monica? Anathema. Wow, you actually do it. It's like a curse. Because then you're like, oh. Anathema. Anathema is a word that is kind of like a curse. It is to excommunicate, um, to curse, to expel, to condemn, to eternal damnation. So as we are affirming Catholic doctrine at the Council of Trent, we are also condemning the people who disagree with Catholic doctrine. So there are several anathemas that are put out at the Council of Trent. First of all, if anyone shall say that man may be justified before God by his own works, whether done through the strength of human nature or through the teaching of the law, without the divine grace through Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Let him burn in hell if he does not believe our doctrines. Now keep in mind, this is a repudiation of what is often a myth about Catholicism, that Catholicism says that you can be saved through your good works. This here is a repudiation of that idea that someone can be saved through themselves without the divine grace of Jesus Christ. Then, if anyone shall say that since Adam sinned, the free will of man is lost and extinguished, or that it is a thing with a name only, yea, a title without a reality, a figment, let him be anathema. If anyone repudiates free will, let him be anathema. Uh, this is aimed at Luther and Calvin especially, um, who have minimized the importance of free will. Remember the Catholic doctrine uh, of the formula for salvation being divine grace with the cooperation of a human being's free will. If anyone shall say that by faith alone the impious is justified, so as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order unto the obtaining the grace of justification, let him be anathema. All right, Martin Luther. 
who is saying that uh, you are justified by faith alone, not by works, so that no one can boast. Sorry. Game over. Burn in hell, Martin Luther. That's not from me. That's from the Council of Trent. Uh, you know, I want everybody to go to heaven myself. While a lot of people are being anathemized in uh, these canons of the Council of Trent, keep in mind that the Council of Trent is doing more than condemning reformers to hell. It is also resulting in a reformation of church practice. Keep in mind that reformers had two objections, doctrine and practice. So the doctrines are not moving, they are not changing, but church practices are going to change, that the Catholic Church is going to take some measures to ensure that they are delivering a quality product. So first of all, the quality of priest is going to increase. That was one of the big sticking points for a lot of people, including people like Erasmus, who were loyal Catholics, that could you educate these priests a little better? So you start to see the establishment of seminaries, which are schools specifically for the training of priests. And today, Catholic priests are some of the most educated ministers in the world, because every Catholic priest has been to a Catholic seminary. Um, your average Catholic priest not only has a bachelor's degree, but a master's degree, has studied theology for three years on top of getting their college degree. And the church is going to fight corruption. Remember, there was a big controversy over the sale of indulgences. Now, the Catholic Church is defending its doctrines. It's saying indulgences, the Pope's authority to forgive sins as Christ's vicar, that's okay. But they're not for sale, okay? So the Catholic Church is affirming its doctrines, but reforming its practices. All right, moving on to religious orders that were founded during this time of the Counter-Reformation. Lots of new orders of priests, monks, and nuns, uh, the most prominent being the Society of Jesus, also known as the Jesuits. The Jesuits were founded by Ignatius of Loyola. Keep in mind there are Jesuit colleges today named Loyola after the founder of the Jesuits. And Ignatius was a converted knight. Here is a picture of young Ignatius Loyola in his armor. He's got uh, his spear, and he's looking very warriorly. Well, he decides to convert to a different sort of warfare. When he becomes a priest later on, he believes that his calling is to be engaged in spiritual warfare uh, against the Reformation and also spiritual warfare against internal sins within himself. The mission of the Jesuits is counter-reformation, to counter the Reformation through education. Jesuits are known especially for their universities, Boston College, Georgetown, uh, to name a few. There are several Jesuit universities all over the United States and really the world. Uh, so education is going to be the weapon. The Jesuits are going to go to these new seminaries, they are going to learn Catholic doctrines, and they are going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in spiritual warfare and debate with all of these reformers. And while the Jesuits were focused on countering the Reformation and advancing the church's cause, the Jesuits are also concerned about personal piety. Uh, there was concern that the Catholic Church was not really meeting the spiritual needs of people. So we see that these new religious orders are serving the purpose also of advancing spirituality, that the Catholic Church is offering spiritual renewal. And so these spiritual exercises emphasize personal piety. If we look at Ignatius Loyola's spiritual exercises, the first rule is that all judgment laid aside, very important, 
all judgment laid aside. You've got Martin Luther who says that he can interpret the scriptures better than any church or priest. The Jesuits say, look, we are laying all judgment aside. We ought to have our mind ready and prompt to obey in all the true spouse of Christ our Lord, which is our holy mother, the church hierarchical. Moving on to the ninth rule, to praise all precepts of the church, keeping the mind prompt to find reasons in their defense and in no manner against them. Ours is not to question why, ours is but to do and die. Uh, these are kind of like the, uh, called sometimes the foot soldiers of the Pope. You can see um, the very soldierly ethic about these rules. And the 13th rule, one of my favorites, uh, to be right in everything, we ought always to hold that the white which I see is black. If the hierarchical church so decides it. So if there is a conflict between what I am seeing, uh, my interpretation of Scripture, and the church's interpretation of Scripture, my reason versus Catholic doctrine, the church needs to win out. That my personal preference needs to yield to the better judgment of the church. And this is all part of a revival of spirituality within the Catholic Church and the foundation of these new religious orders. This spiritual revival is often seen in the person of St. Teresa of Avila, who was a monastic reformer, a theologian, a mystic, a woman who saw visions, was held to be very holy. Uh, during this time, a lot of monasteries served as entertainment places for rich people. Some rich guy would be coming through and they'd give him a lot of good food and drink, and he'd make a donation to the monastery. Teresa felt like this is not what a monastery is about, uh, that there needs to be more simplicity and more of a focus on spirituality. The Ecstasy of St. Teresa, a Baroque sculpture by Bernini, is really expressive. When you look at this, you see that Teresa is ecstatic here, okay, thus the ecstasy. And she is uh, beside herself in this moment of spirituality, okay? You see this angel hovering over her, and Teresa is overcome uh, with uh, this spiritualness or whatever we would call it. Uh, so just keep in mind the ecstasy of St. Teresa, that there is something... Um, almost erotic about spirituality uh, from this point of view. And let's not forget the simplicity, okay, that uh, we need to keep in mind these vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Uh, Teresa, for one, uh, she did not wear shoes. Uh, she went around barefoot all the time. Uh, so you see one of those, sh no shirt, no shoes, no service signs. Sorry, St. Teresa, we don't serve your kind here. So summing up, once again, the Counter-Reformation is in three parts. The first being the Council of Trent, the second being the Society of Jesus and various other religious orders that are founded during this time, and the third being the revival of Catholic spirituality. Hopefully you learned something today. Uh, go ahead and subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos or take a look at some of these other Reformation videos that are going to get started in just a bit on the credits. Thank you. Until next time.